Hi, this is your Sapin Bhartiya and we are here at KubeCon and CloudNativeCon in Atlanta and today we have with us Tucker Kalave, CEO of Mesmo. Tucker, it's great to have you on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I would love to know a bit about the company itself. So talk about the company. Yeah, we've got a long history uh, managing telemetry data. So we started as a log management company about eight or nine years ago. And uh, actually the original name of the company was LogDNA. Uh, and so about two, three years ago, we switched the name to Mesmo. And that for us was really a focus away from uh, you know processing data on disk to, to processing data more in real time and taking more of a data pipelining approach to the, the way we handle telemetry data. So a big shift for us warranted a, a change in culture, change in the name of the company and everything. So we're, it actually plays great with AI. So we'll, we'll get into that, I'm sure, but uh, yeah, super excited. Yeah. yeah. Talk about what are you announcing here at KubeCon because I'm pretty sure that it has something to do with AI and it has something to do with SRE. Yeah, well, good guess. Uh, you know, I'd say that there's, uh, yeah, two obviously big topics here are AI and SRE. You know, we've been dealing with this type of data for a long time. And so our journey to our AI SRE solution was really interesting. We've actually taken a different approach to it. There are uh, many announcements about ARS or AI SREs right now. Our approach is more to optimize the input to the LLM. So we're not training LLMs. We're doing what we call context engineering. And that context engineering is refining all the data as an input to an LLM. And we found that we get uh, really, really accurate results for like 10% of the cost of what you'll typically see. And we can get you going and getting value out of it in five minutes. So no need to train. We don't use your data to train. You use the foundational base models and we can get you up and running in five minutes. Can you also talk about when we talk about AI and SRE, what does it really mean? Because when we look at SRE engineers, when we look at DevOps, first of all, you know, sometimes when the terms come up, everybody has its own definition. They yeah, define yeah. it in their way. How do you define it? I actually don't like the term AI SRE because an SRE is like a person with a job. I like to think of it more as AI, what I'm specifically focused on is more the AI driven observability aspects, mm -hmm. which I would break down into detection, diagnosis and remediation of incidents. Okay. And our focus is really on the diagnosis because I, we believe that you really have to deeply trust the diagnosis if we're ever going to get to automation of the remediation and closing that full loop. One of the reasons I don't love the term AI SRE is because there's so many things an SRE does. There, there's like been a, a you know a job a role that has taken on so many disciplines over the years, and so what I like to think about is freeing them from having to manage the kind of minutia of the task and the incidents, and getting them back to designing, scaling, and you know building systems. So I, I so again I think of it more of a detection, remediate uh, re detection, diagnosis, and remediation of incidents, and if we can really tighten that loop up in an automated, agentic way, then we're going to really free the SREs up to do other type of work. You also mentioned accuracy, but we also have to talk about the speed, you know, so it's faster. And when I was reading some of the material there, you know, that you detect and fix issue faster than others, because actually, interesting thing, I have already had a couple of discussions here yeah. with Ella in terms of AI SREs. Uh, so, so talk about, you know, how, how did you manage to reach that speed? Yeah. And, and what, what, what is it that makes it far? Is it model, data, or the architecture itself? It's the architecture itself and its influence on the data. Okay. It's not the model. Okay. It's not training the model. It's not the model learning. It is actually just using the foundational models. And what we did is we looked at, we took the, I'm gonna train the model approach and it just took too long and the accuracy wasn't there and the cost was too high. And so we scrapped that approach a number about six months ago and we started to look at what are the bottlenecks inside of the LLM that are causing accuracy problems, that are causing cost and efficiency problems. And we, we basically offloaded the majority of the work. So we do all the embeddings, all the, we do all the pre-work, the pre-fill work, if you will, it's inside the inference model. We do all the pre-fill work offline so that the model is much more efficient, has a much better, uh, tighter, uh, like refined, already parsed data. And that gives much better accuracy and, and, and quicker results. So we actually end up sending Part of the reason we're like 90% cheaper is we only send 10% of the data because we've pre-processed and pre-embedded and vectorized and all those things, the data 
before we send it to the LLM. Sometimes they focus more on accuracy yeah. as much as speed. So how do you maintain that balance? Well, it's pretty easy it's for us because we're, we're again, we're it's, a, it's all about the attention model and we're spending most of the attention model from the LLM on the accuracy and the speed. So we don't spend it on the input, we only spend it on the output. And so by, by basically providing really rich contextualized data to the LLM, it spends all its time, uh, it, it doesn't get confused, we don't have context confusion, uh, we don't have context poisoning or any of those things. And so it, is, it can be very accurate because it's got a very good refined set of data. And, and it's all related, it's all, to me it's all efficiency, and efficiency kind of unfurls itself into accuracy lower cost and speed. And how do you also deal with things like hallucination when AI makes things up on its own? Well, that's going to happen. But uh, but what we found that we can greatly reduce that. The hallucinations are usually based on uh, the amount of context and confusion that it has. And so we find that the hallucinations are um, drastically reduced when we provide the, this pre-filled context. So basically, if you think about how much of it is probabilistic versus deterministic, we're doing about 80% of what the LLM would normally do in a deterministic way offline. And by giving that deterministic data, we're greatly reducing the probabilistic nature of the LLM. And we're just using it for that final piece of analysis to actually find the root cause in a, in a much more trusting and accurate way. When we look at, you know, Mesmo's AI, sorry, uh, when it tries, since we're here at KubeCon, let's talk about Kubernetes, you know, it yeah. tries to uh, auto remediate something <laughs> Uh, what kind of issues it can handle right now? Of course, it will evolve over time, but what is the status right now? Yeah, I think that's, I mean, that's a very, um, that's a very customer dependent answer. I think that's about your risk profile more than it is about capabilities right now. So you have all the capabilities. We have all the capabilities to do it. It's, it's a, so you, yeah, then, but then it gets, you get, it's a very, like, it's almost like a very personal decision. Like mm -hmm. what kind of authorization protocols and whitelisting and things like that do you have internally? How complex is your environment? What do you feel comfortable running in an automated remediation fashion versus not? That's probably the biggest driver right now is is uh, is not the capability, but but people's um, uh, you know uh, own controls. What we think is really important to get people to raise their risk tolerance is to be really really focused on the trust and the diagnosis. So the diagnosis is going to say we think this is the problem and here's the here's the suggested remediation. Right. And so that like really uh, tightening trust in that is where we think is going to make the most gains in actually taking the next step and driving the automated remediation. And how closely do you work with customers? It's more like, hey, this is a solution. You go sign up and you deal with yourself or you yeah. get involved as well. Well, so when you when you talk about the remediation, uh, that's going to be a very involved conversation because you're, you're now executing in people's environments. So that, of course, you have to get very involved in. One of the things we're super proud of is in a couple of weeks, we're about to turn on the, the AI SRE agent for every single one of our customers. So, the, so there, we have about 3,500 people that log in every week and every single one of them is going to get this for no additional charge because we do it so efficiently and it'll be available in our UI. It can be consumed through the MCP server and through your native environments, but we're going to turn this on for everyone. And we can do that because we have taken a different approach. We don't have to train. We don't need your data to, to do this. We are, we are going to refine the context based on our experience and give you the AI-driven outcome. While initially you said that, you know, you don't like the term AI and a sorry, yeah. but sometimes whether we like it or not, that becomes a new norm. You yeah. know, that becomes a standard practice. Uh, where do you see... Observability, I mean, observability has evolved, you know, over time from metrics, logging, you know. Uh, where do you see uh, observability is going to evolve with AI agents becoming more common? And every almost everybody is, I mean, autonomous, uh, that has already become a standard, but where do you see it's heading? Yeah, like I think we're going to, I think we're going to find ourselves in a world uh, where we have a very different relationship with dashboards and UIs compared to what we used to. Um, so like now today, the process is we identify an incident and then we go through an investig investigatory process in a UI trying to find what it, like, like a data dog or a new relic is helping you investigate an issue. And then human cognition is completing that loop to determine the root cause analysis. All that's going to go away in the, in, in the years to come. And so there's really no purpose in having this visualization layer in observability. And so we're increasingly going to see these analysis capabilities happen agentically and then the remediation happened automatically. So I think we'll find ourselves in more, what I would call a headless observability really quickly. 
I think that's really coming our way. And the whole notion of visualizations and dashboards and investigatory stuff, it, you know, in that UI is really going to go away. And what does it mean for human in loop? What it is mean by SRE engineers? Uh, because, you know, even when the SRE came, you know, the new labels, I mean, we have seen the evolution of personas as well. Yeah. How much human intervention, human involvement will be there, or the system will be so autonomous that we won't need SRE rules? Yeah, I think that's, I, that's an interesting one. I'm not sure I know the answer to that yet. I think some of that is going to be defined by how do the applications evolve, right? Because you, you do have a lot of legacy applications that, that carry a lot of com complexity. And of course, that's going to have a, a much longer human in the loop process to it. But we have two disruptive forces happening. One is the opportunity of how we do observability. And the other is the opportunity in how we deliver applications. And so if, the, if people are really take advantage, which I think they will, how they deliver applications, that's going to be increasingly done through AI, you know, vibe coding and agentic you know, development. And that will transform the, the application base combined with the transformation observability. We may actually get there a lot faster than people think if those, as those two kind of forces come together. And what does it mean for uh, cost and complexity? Kubernetes, everybody talks about complexity. When you move to cloud, we talk about cost as well. How will AI, SRE, or Mesmo help tame cost and complex? Will it make things more complicated, more costly, yeah. or will it make it less complicated and more cost efficient? So that's a good question. And I think that left to its own devices, it becomes much more complicated. Our foundation, I mentioned earlier on that our foundation is about processing data in real time. And so we have a very uh, uh, sophisticated capability behind the scenes in our data pipeline that helps structure, normalize, and it really focuses on what we call active telemetry, which is the telemetry data you need to do, drive these outcomes, not the telemetry data that you don't need, which we would, we, we would like store off in a, a three bucket or something like that. So um, the answer to that is, really a data management problem. We can make this very complex or we can make this very simple. And so, so one of the capabilities we'll have is the agentic ability to manage, do the data, data engineering behind the data behind the scenes. And so that data management capability, super important to the overall simplicity of the problem. Are there any specific kind of workload, any specific industries that Mesmo is targeting, or it's, it's SRE, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, I've always been in the mindset that, you know, while there are, you know, different governance and compliance requirements, that by and large, the management of systems is the management of systems. And so we're not designing for any particular industry at this point in time. We're more designing for the tasks and the jobs. And, and, and obviously, there's a huge emphasis that we have on Kubernetes as, a, as an ecosystem. Uh, but I would say, broadly speaking, we're designing for the, the role of the SRE and, and really taking this, uh, the diagnosis, or sorry, the detection, diagnosis, and remediation off their plates. Of course, you folks announce it here at KubeCon, but you have, I'm pretty sure, working with partner, design partners, beta testing. What kind of feedback you have received, which helped refine it? At the same time, it also gave you a pulse on what users want. Well, we found that, that people were really struggling, like getting through the barrier of having to train and how long it takes to onboard and the confidence that they have. And so that's why we kind of set out to take a different approach. And so our approach, again, which doesn't require training, can get you onboarded in five minutes, focuses on us engineering the context as the input to the LLM versus the output is like much like the time to value on that is so fast that um, that's where we've gotten the best feedback because people can spin it up in, in a morning and within an hour be getting value out of it and finding like new outcomes very easy to get to so yeah Tucker, thank you so much for joining me here at the event and of course uh, gave a great you know uh, detail and insights into sre ai thank you so much and i look forward to chat with you again thank okay. you thanks again looking for the next one